Good to have you this morning. Thanks for being with us today. No matter where you're watching from, how you're watching, we're glad you're here. Well, this morning, I want to jump right into the message. And uh, so if you have a Bible, uh, turn to Matthew 16. If you're using a device, power up to Matthew chapter 16. And today I want to start a brand new series that I'm calling Jesus Has a Question. You know, when you read through the Gospels and you study the teaching method of Jesus, you will discover that one of the most popular and most effective techniques that Jesus used in teaching was that of asking questions. And and in fact, I want to encourage you sometime. Uh, Sit down, open your Bible, read through the Gospels. It may take you several settings and make a list of every single question that Jesus asks, whether that question is asked to an individual or whether that question is asked to a group of people. Now, you'll need quite a bit of paper because if you get them all, you're going to have a list of over 300 questions that Jesus asked. So beginning today and lasting for the next 300 Sundays, uh, well, I'm not going to do it that way, but we, we are going to take uh, just a few of them. And over the next three weeks, we're going to look at some of those questions. Today, we're going to focus on questions Jesus has regarding your conversion. And then next week, we're going to look at questions Jesus has regarding your commitment. And on the final part of the series, part three, we'll look at questions Jesus has regarding your concerns, your conversion, your commitment, your concerns. So we began today talking about questions Jesus has regarding your conversion. Now, I planned to go over three questions. So if you picked up the sermon notes on the way in or you're picking up the sermon notes online, you'll discover there are three questions. We're only going to deal with question number one and question number three. I might mention question number two, but we're just going to deal with question one and question three. And the first question we're going to deal with just might be the most important question Jesus ever asked of anybody. And it's a question he asks of his disciples. And the question is simply this. Who do you say that I am? That's the question. And for the disciples, that will be the most important question they will ever answer. And that question remains for you and I today. And this question... Who do you say that I am? That question is still today the most important question you could ever answer. In fact, there's more riding on this one question than any of the other 299 plus questions that Jesus asked. So the first question becomes extremely critical. Who do you say that I am? So I want to begin by reading a little bit of the context from which this question stems. And I'm going to invite you here at our Gaylor campus, but our Sioux campus, our Alpena watch group, all the other watch groups from Florida to Canada. Would you please stand with me if you're physically able for the reading of God's word? And here's what it says. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse number 13. It says, now when Jesus, and he's with his disciples, came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. And that is going to be paramount. Understanding where they are is critical. He was asking his disciples question number one, which is a little more general. The question is this. Guys, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What's the word on the street? What are people saying? Who am I? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, who had been recently beheaded. Some say you're Elijah. 
Some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And now comes the key question. And he said to them, but who do you? And that word you there is plural. He's talking to all the disciples. This is a question everyone must answer individually. But who do you say that I am? And no surprise to any of us, before anyone else even had a chance to process the question, Peter pipes up, right? But this time, he nails it. This time, he doesn't stick his foot in his mouth like he does so many other times. He says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ. The son of the living God, or literally translated, you are the Christ, the living one, the son of God. And Jesus said to him, gold star, Simon. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, his given name, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven revealed this to you. And may God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, you may be seated. Who do you say that I am? Well, to understand the significance of the question, we have to first talk about the place where Jesus is when he asks them the question. He is in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi would be located about 30 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jesus mainly during his ministry, spent time on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, the Capernaum area. But one day he says to his disciples, come on guys, we're going on a hike. And they walk some 30 miles from the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee all the way to Caesarea Philippi in the northern part of Israel for one purpose. Because it was the perfect place for Jesus to ask the most important question those disciples would ever answer. It would be like me saying, worship was great and I'm ready to preach. But before I preach, let's all walk up to Indian River. And when we get up to Indian River, you can sit down, I'll preach, and we'll walk back. That's basically what Jesus did. Because what was in Caesarea Philippi was important. He could have asked the question on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. But he wanted the backdrop of Caesarea Philippi. Why? Because Caesarea Philippi in that day, in that region, was the hotbed of paganism. You could call it the Disneyland of the gods. It was Sin City in the northern region of Israel. It was extremely pagan. It was Greek. In fact, Jews never went there. It was a Greek stronghold of false religion and paganism. And Caesarea Philippi to this day is an amazing place to go and just look. I've been there six different times. And you look at the side of this basically mountain, huge bedrock wall, and you can still see all the niches carved into the walls where they put different idols, many, many different gods, and they built temples. It's estimated that at one point there were no less than 14 temples to 14 different false gods at Caesarea Philippi. Now the three primary temples would be number one, the temple to Caesar Augustus because emperor worship was huge in the Roman Empire. Number two was the temple to the false god Zeus. You've heard of him. And number three was the temple to the god Pan. Now, Pan was the primary false deity in Caesarea Philippi. Now, if you remember from your days of studying high school or college mythology, you might remember that Pan was that half-man, 
half goat. And he played kind of like a flute type instrument. And, uh, and, and Pan was the central deity in Caesarea Philippi. And not only did the false god Pan affect the culture around Caesarea Philippi in that day, it still affects our culture even today. When Walt Disney brought up the character Peter Pan, and I think that's a great great cartoon but they actually got Peter Pan from the god Pan that's why he's named Peter Pan and that's why in the original Peter Pan he played a flute like instrument so even Peter Pan comes from the false god Pan which is why I eat Jif peanut butter okay and uh, but anyway um, not only that but we get today a word we all use at times from the false god Pan. And it's the word panic. And it was first used in that day, in that language, describing the god Pan as he would go out into the forest playing his flute-like instrument and causing panic among people in the forest. So Pan becomes the central figure. And it was a very, very pagan religion. In fact, they had as part, and you can, by the way, and I encourage you to do this, Google Caesarea Philippi. And you will find artists, you can see what it looks like today, but you will find artists' rendition of what it most likely looked like at the time of Jesus. It's staggering. And one of the areas that were there, there was an upper area and a lower area, that was the area where they worshipped the dancing goats because of Pan. It's where the temple of Pan was. And they would worship the goats by sacrificing goats, and by committing acts of bestiality with the goats. Very pagan environment. But as bad as that was, the worship of Pan also included sacrificing their own children in order to get the blessing of Pan. And what happened is, as you're looking at this side of this mountain, there's a cave now the cave today is empty. Coming out from that cave used to be the temple to Caesar Augustus. And in the cave was a spring. And water rushed out of that spring underneath the temple of Augustus and flowed right into the Jordan River because this is at the base of Mount Hermon where the headwaters to the Jordan River would come. And this spring inside the cave, which is no longer there now, the spring isn't, it's dried up, was so deep they could not plummet and find the bottom of it. So they believed it was the entrance into the underworld. And they called it in that day, and you can read it on the sign that's there to this day, they called the spring in that cave the gate of Hades. The gate of of Hades, the place of the dead. This is where Jesus takes his disciples. A place where Jews did not go because of the paganism. But he wants to ask them this question. With all of that, and I could describe much more as a backdrop. So, as they come into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the first question, pretty general, pretty innocent, not really a wrong answer. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What's the word on the street, guys? What are people saying about me? I mean, I see everything going on over there with that paganism and the, the worship of all these false gods, but what do people say about me? And I, I kind of chuckle at the answer of the disciples. Because their answer is only positive things. Have you noticed that? They give three possibilities. All three are good. Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Now remember that John the Baptist had just recently been martyred. 
he had spoken up against a politician and the politician cut off his head. Let me make a note to myself. Don't speak about, there we go. And, um, and they said, so some say you're John the Baptist resurrected. Some say you're Elijah resurrected. Remember him from the Old Testament? And some say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. I chuckle because it doesn't appear they gave Jesus any of the other side. Just a few chapters earlier, remember what the Pharisees called Jesus? You are a son of Beelzebul. You're a son of Satan. They, they didn't bring that one up. They just kind of mentioned the positive things. That's the word on the street, Jesus. And then Jesus asks them the critical question. The first question, there was really no wrong answer. The second question is pass or fail. And a lot's riding on it. And question number two is this. All right, guys. But who do you say that I am? See, that's the real issue. You've been walking with me now for a while. You've been listening to me teach. You've seen me do many miracles. So here's my question. Who do you say that I am? Do you just think I'm John the Baptist resurrected? Do you think I'm Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets? Who do you say that I am? Critical question. And Peter responds. He says, you are the Christ. Now, please understand, Christ is not the last name of Jesus. His name is not first name Jesus, last name Christ, right? My first name Scott, my last name Distler. They didn't have last names back then. It's not Jesus and his middle initials H. It's not Jesus H Christ, like you heard you so much today. That's not it. The word Christ was a title. The Christ, it means anointed one, Messiah. You are the one who was promised from God, the one sent to save us. You are the Christ, the living one, the son of God. So here's what Peter's saying. Jesus, I'll tell you who you are. In contrast to all of those false gods, you're the true God. And I'm sure he's looking right at that mountain. In contrast to all of those dead gods, you're the living God. And Jesus says, good job, Simon. God has revealed to you who I am. We're not going to keep reading in that portion because I want to get somewhere else and connect it. But if you keep reading, you'll see that Jesus uses that to change Peter's name. Peter's name was Simon. And Jesus says, from now on, you'll be called Peter. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. Now, the word for Peter and the word for rock are similar but different. And it's important that you understand the difference. Because some people teach that this is Jesus saying, you are now the rock, Peter, and I'm going to build my church upon you, Peter. You're going to be the foundation of the church. It's all going to stem from you. It's not what Jesus is saying. The word translated Peter is a word that literally describes a small pebble. He wasn't saying, Peter, you're going to be the foundation. He's saying, Peter, you're just a small pebble. But upon the rock of the truth of what you just said, upon the truth of the statement of the fact that I am the Christ, the living one, the son of God, on that truth, Peter, I'm going to build my church. And by the way, that's the first time in the Bible, in the New Testament, that you see the word church right there. And he said, and... It's going to be so powerful that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I believe when Jesus said those words, he pointed right at the cave where that spring was because that's what they called the gates of Hades. And you know what Jesus was saying? 
be there upon the rock of that statement, who I am. I'm going to build my church and no amount of paganism is going to stop it. No amount of demonism is going to stop it. No amount of Satanism is going to stop it. No amount of humanism is going to stop it. No amount of materialism is going to stop it. I will build my church and nothing will stop my plan. Who do you say that I am? Now, why does so much ride on that statement, on that question? And here's the answer. Because the answer to that question determines the eternity of your soul. That's why. There's a lot riding on this. Yesterday, I was able to re-watch um, the ceremony at the U.S. Capitol when they unveiled the statue of Billy Graham. And it was a very moving ceremony. I, I, they haven't asked me to pose yet for my sculpture, but, but they did his already. And, um, and the statue is a beautiful statue, but at the base of the statue, they have etched in two verses of the Bible, not just the reference, the whole verse. On one side is John 3.16. And if you walk through the U.S. Capitol, you can stop at the Billy Graham statue and read this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You see, there's a lot riding on the question, who do you say Jesus is? On the other side of the statue, they etched in John 14, 6. Jesus said unto them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father unless they come through me. 1 John chapter 5 says, he that has the Son, Jesus Christ, has eternal life. But he that does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. You see, friends, the reason this question is the most important question you can ever answer is this. Because where your soul spends eternity is based on the answer to that question. So I want to pause there. And I want to jump over to a second question that Jesus asked, and we'll connect them. And the second question comes in John chapter 11. The first question, do you, um, who do you say that I am, was asked to the disciples as a group. This question was asked to an individual, a woman in the city of Bethany by the name of Martha. And the question Jesus asked Martha is this. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Now let me read what prompted the question. And then we'll go back and fill in the blanks. Because when Jesus has this conversation with Martha, her brother Lazarus has just died. Martha is grieving. And in John 11, verse 23, Jesus said to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks Martha the question, do you believe this? And Martha in her grief answers very similar to how Peter answered the first question, who do you say that I am? Look what Martha says in verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes 
into the world. Now let me back up. What prompted all of this? Well, I'm sure you know the story, most of you. Jesus had a very, very good friend during his earthly ministry. And that friend's name was Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and her sister Mary. Now Lazarus and Mary and Martha were believers in Jesus. They lived in Bethany. Bethany was located on the other side of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. So if I'm standing at the eastern gate looking at the Mount of Olives, the slope going up the mountain would be the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed. The top of the mountain would be where Jesus ascended back into heaven and one day where his feet will touch down when he returns. But on the slope going down the other side of the mountain, you would find the city of Bethany. And Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived there. They're very good friends with Jesus. How they became BFFs, I'm not sure. It doesn't say, but they became very, very good friends. Very good friends. In fact, so good of friends that Jesus and his disciples were welcomed at their house any time. And there are multiple times that Jesus and his disciples stopped there for a meal or even to spend the night. You'll read about some great stories that happened in Bethany in the Bible. And one day, Jesus is nowhere near Bethany, and Mary and Martha send him a message. And the message simply says this, your friend Lazarus is about to die. Now why did Mary and Martha send that message to Jesus? Were they just wanting to inform him? No, I think it was more than that. In that message was an unspoken request. Because they knew Jesus was the Christ. They knew he did miracles. They knew he healed people. So when they say, Jesus, your good friend Lazarus is about to die, what are they really saying to Jesus? You need to come. You need to drop what you're doing. You need to get here to Bethany. You need to heal Lazarus so Lazarus doesn't die. It's obvious that's what Mary and Martha want. They've got it all figured out. All Jesus has to do is listen to them. Have you ever been in that situation? Where you had a situation in your life, but you had it all figured out? Jesus, if you'll just listen to me, I'll tell you exactly what you need to do. You ever been there? We all have, right? And that's what they're doing. However, Jesus chooses not to go immediately. In fact, Jesus doesn't show up until four days after Lazarus died and was buried. And in that day, they would bury you immediately. Because in the Jewish custom, there was no embalming. And in that climate, you would begin to decay very quickly. So they would bury you quickly. So four days after Lazarus dies and is buried, Martha gets word that Jesus is on the outskirts of town. So Martha goes out to meet Jesus. And here's what she says to him in verse 21. Five words. She begins her statement with this. If you had been here. What was Martha saying? Jesus, I don't get it. You blew it. We told you exactly what to do. Why didn't you listen? If you would have come, you would have healed Lazarus He would not have died. But for some strange reason, a reason for the life of us we cannot wrap our heads around, you didn't come. You didn't show up. You're late. Have you ever spoken those words to God? I have. God, this isn't how it was supposed to be. Why didn't you listen? Why didn't you show up? Martha is dismayed. She is rustling in her mind 
and in her spirit. She's trying to put all this together. How, how can you be good, but you didn't show up? How can you be loving, but you didn't show up? I thought Lazarus was your friend, but you didn't show up. What I love about Jesus is the way he responds. Jesus gives her room to be dismayed. Jesus gives her room to grieve. He doesn't scold her. He doesn't look at her and say, Martha, bite your tongue. Martha, how can you say that? Martha, where's your faith? Jesus understands what she's feeling. He understands that there is a common feeling that any of us would have in that situation. So instead of rebuking her, Jesus responds to Martha by gently reminding her of three truths. Truth number one, your brother will rise again. Truth number two, I am the resurrection and the life. Truth number three, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And then gently, he asks her the question, Martha, I know you're dismayed. I know you're confused. I know you've got a lot of unanswered questions. I know you're having trouble wrapping your head and your heart around this. But Martha, underneath all of that, do you still believe I am who I claim to be? Do you believe? Folks, do you realize it's possible to be dismayed and still believe? It's possible to have trouble wrapping your head around why something happened, but still underneath it, believe. And you see that in Martha, for sure. But you see it also in Mary. Because in verse number 32, Mary now meets Jesus. She is going to start her conversation with Jesus with the same words Martha did. It's obvious Mary and Martha have talked. They have the same talking points. And Martha, who started, if you had been here, now in verse number 32, Mary says the same thing. If you had been here. If you had been here, Jesus. It's your fault. In fact, look at it in John eleven thirty-two. 32. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him. And I love this. Even in her dismay, she fell at his feet. Do you realize that every time you see Mary, the, brother, uh, the sister of Lazarus in the Bible, she's always at the feet of Jesus? Did you know that? It's incredible. And she said to him, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Same conversation. Does this anger Jesus? Does this get under Jesus' skin? Are these sisters on his last nerve? No. He gets it. He gets it. Look what he says in verse 33. It says, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews with her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. So what happens? You know the story, but let me read it. Look at verse 38. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now the tomb was a cave, and a stone was lying against it, just like the tomb of Jesus would be. Very common in that day. A stone rolled in front of the entrance to the tomb to keep the wild animals from going in and to keep the stench of decay from coming out. And what does he say in verse 39? He says, remove the stone. T take the stone away from the entrance. <laughs> and Martha, I love her answer. 
Martha, the one who was always the worker, always wanted to make sure everything was in place. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, said to him, Jesus, you're such a man. Only a man would ask us to do that. Us women know that's not a good idea. She said, Lord, by this time, there will be a stench that will knock us off our feet. Because he's been dead for days. It's in times like this, I miss the King James version of the Bible that I grew up on. Because it's so direct. And in the King James, it literally says, and Martha said to Jesus, but he stinketh. That was her concern. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? So they removed the stone, and I have to think that everyone is just covering their face because of the stench. And it says, then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said this so they may believe that you sent me. In other words, Jesus is going to do what he's going to do for one reason. He wants to prove to the people who he is so they will believe in him. And when he had said these things, verse 43, he cried out with a what kind of voice? How can you say that word so softly? He cried out with a what kind of voice? Yeah. He shouted it. What did he shout? Lazarus! I guess he's thinking, if you're dead, you're hard of hearing, right? Lazarus, come forth. Now I want to stop right there at the end of verse 43. Because I get excited about this. Because I now draw a parallel from John 11 to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When Paul describes the day that Jesus is going to return for his church. And here's what Paul says. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what? With a shout. Now it doesn't say what he's going to shout. What is he going to say? Surprise! Ta-da! I don't know. doesn't say. But I got a hint from John 11. Because in John 11, he shouted outside the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth! And I think that on that day, a day that I believe could happen even today, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And I think the shout will be a command for the bodies of every dead believer whose souls have been in heaven since they passed. It will be a shout for those bodies to be resurrected from the dead, changed into an incorruptible, immortal body, reunited with their soul for all of eternity. And the reason I believe that is because the next verse says, he'll return from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ will rise. This is a preview of coming attractions. Lazarus, come forth! And the Bible says, the man who had died came forth. But notice how specific the description is. He came forth bound hand and foot with linen wrappings and his face wrapped around with a cloth and Jesus said to him unbind him and let him go and I laugh at this because when I look at all the different Hollywood type versions of this story they all have Lazarus coming out of the tomb like Frankenstein moving towards them It's not how it was. 
He was still bound the way he was buried. In that day, they literally, like a mummy, wrap linen wrappings around you from your feet all the way to your neck. Then they tied a face cloth around your face. Lazarus didn't come out of the tomb like this. He came out like a bunny, hopping out. And Jesus said, say, take the wrappings off. What a sight that would have been to see. Now notice the response of the people in verse 45, and we'll bring it to an end. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus had just done, they believed in him. Do you believe? But some of them went to the Pharisees, the people who hated Jesus, and said, you better do something about this guy. You see, some recognized who Jesus was and became believers. Others recognized who Jesus was and became bitter. And each of us must answer these questions. Who do you say that Jesus is? I believe that Jesus was God in the flesh who lived a perfect life, who died on a cross as a substitute for me, as a sacrifice for my sin. And that in so doing, he paid the penalty for my sin in full so that I don't have to pay it at all. And that he rose again from the dead and he's alive today and he is the only way to heaven. Eternal life comes from faith alone in Christ alone. That's what I believe. And I believe that one day that same Jesus is going to return. Who do you say that Jesus is? Do you believe this? I remember when I was a child, five years old, and I would attend the Good News Club my aunt taught every week. And every week I heard my aunt tell the story of Jesus. I knew the story. I heard her tell it a million times. I knew the story. But I remember that one afternoon when I was sitting in the living room of a house and my aunt told the story again, a story I knew that it dawned on me. I knew the story, but I had never put my faith in Jesus. And that was the day I invited Jesus to come into my life to be my savior. And maybe this morning, whether you're here at our Gaylor campus, up at our Sioux campus, watching in Alpena, Maybe this morning that describes you. You know the story. You've heard it. You've been attending for a while. You've been listening online or on TV for a while. But you realize this morning you've never crossed that line of faith. You've never put your trust into Jesus. You can do that right now. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And right where you're at, you can say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I'm going to trust you and only you, what you did for me on the cross, for my forgiveness of sins, for my eternal life in heaven. Please come into my life. Please save me. You can do it right now. Maybe this morning. You're here or you're watching from somewhere. And you're going, you know, I I think I understand who Jesus is. I think I got that down. But I'm just not ready to cross that line yet. I'm not ready to make that decision. That I would say to you, would you pray this prayer? Jesus, I think I know who you are. I'm just not sure I'm ready to put my faith in you. Would you please help me to believe before it's too late. Would you pray that prayer? And maybe this morning, you're here at one of our campuses, our watch groups. Maybe this morning, you're watching on TV or online in your living room or from a hospital or a nursing home, from a restaurant or a laundromat. 
You may even this morning be watching from jail. Heard this week of someone in, a, in northern Michigan who is an inmate watching us in jail. I'm actually going to visit them this week. And maybe what you're thinking right now and you're saying is, I'm going to be honest and tell you, Pastor, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. I'm not sure what I believe. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out why I'm listening to you. And maybe someone invited you to church and told you if you come, I'll buy you lunch. And you're thinking, well, I can listen to a squeaky voice for a while if it means a free lunch. Maybe you were flipping the channels on the TV and you kind of came across it. Maybe you were flipping the radio dial and heard the broadcast. But you said, I'm not there yet. And I would say thank you for your honesty. And I would encourage you to do this. Would you pray this prayer? God, I don't believe, but I'm open to you revealing yourself to me. Who do you say that Jesus is? Do you believe this?